Cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back. This is Sick Talks number 65. Uh, I'm here with Ryan Broderick, who does <laughs> the Garbage Day newsletter and is building, hopefully, a, a, a Garbage Day universe, um, which also includes some other stuff like a private member Discord and, and, and uh, occasional performances and events. I'm sure we'll talk about that with Ryan. But in any case, I think Garbage Day is one of the most e e essential sources of let's call it news interpretation criticism about the world of digital ecosystems. And that's social, that's platform and streaming, that's especially like fan communities, and that sort of stuff. And I, I just, I admire Ryan's work a lot and, and um, was very pleased when he said he would come join us. So anyway, Ryan, welcome. Thank you. I, I have a lot to live up to now, uh, but thank you very <laughs> much. That was very nice. Well, it, let's, let's start there for a second. I help, me understand how you got to garbage day um like w w the trajectory there and then kind of where where it's gone since you founded it because i've been there i think since the beginning proudly as a as a a a, a reader but but um for those who are maybe catching up on it more recently. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I've kicked around digital media forever. My first internship uh was with the all RIP. Um <laughs> writing about like at the time myspace drama um wow yeah where you know and garbage day launched full time for me in 2020 which was uh quite a dark year for everyone and myself <laughs> included and i think that first year kind of felt like a like a therapy project uh kind of like sure. i mean the, the tagline like love to have fun online um was kind of like a, a statement of purpose and also like a challenge to myself to try to remember why I had been writing about the internet for over a decade. Um, and it was also, you know, it was, I was curious if people actually cared still, because, you know, if you work in digital media long enough, you go through these cycles where people, where people tell you, nobody gives a, a damn about this stuff, or it doesn't matter, or, you know, you're working on a news desk and you get the meme uh, research duty while like the real reporters go out in. Is that, you know, the, is that the worst that yeah. me memes are the worst? Well, you know, it used to be annoying because it was like, Oh, you know, when I was first starting, you know, you're sitting in a news desk and you're looking up like viral media. Um, and now we live in a world where everything is viral media and, you know, the, the tables have, have turned a little bit, but, yeah. um, in the last two years, uh, I've been shocked to be honest, that people read Garbage Day and they, they think about it and they like it and they, they message me about it and stuff. <laughs> Are you shocked? Because I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I think imposter syndrome is a weird crutch that we lean on overly as we lean on many other crutches these days. But, but is that because of a kind of feeling of like, how could what I'm doing be that valuable to people? Or is there something else? No. And like, on? and I, I don't, I don't like, you know, I, 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 I refuse to internalize it as a value to people, but I, I do think that in many it, ways, okay. it's garbage day. <laughs> We're going to have a fight about that one because it is tremendously well, valuable, but thank whatever. You. Uh, no, I, I think in many ways, garbage day broke a lot of the rules that had been ingrained to me uh, during the digital media boom of the 2010s, sure. you know, this idea yeah. of not so much a view from nowhere, but a lack of personality, a an emphasis on scale rather than audience, a a a like universally accepted Facebook voice where you're talking to like the lowest common denominator reader that exists and hoping that they, you know, pile in enough to pay for your ad revenue or whatever. And, right. and so with Garbage Day, it was very personalized. It was very insidery, and it has you know grown quite a bit since then. And it's not yeah. nearly as anarchic as it used to be, but it feels very gratifying to be able to talk to people about stuff that's happening and not have to hold their hands through it the way that everyone kind of assumed you had to 10 years sure. ago. Yeah. Well, it's so, it's, that's such an interesting observation because I think, and this is a slight digression. We'll get back to the, to what you said a second ago, but the, the idea that everything has to be explained to people in a handholdy way, I, I feel like is a, quite a generational thing. I don't think it was the case prior to, you know, the mass adoption of social, which coincided with the, for, uh, let's call it the ensconcement of the, of, of millennial generation. But I, it, it, it's funny that you should say that. And I, and it's, it, from my standpoint, it's like one of these old Gen X guys who had to fight tooth and nail for every bit of context. It feels like a return to form. 
but I'm 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 interested sure. to hear that. I mean, my my earliest moments, like not reading the newspapers my parents bought, but like reading the things that I would buy. I think the major yeah. one was Wizard magazine, uh, which was like a comic book magazine. Um, of course, I would open it as a ten or eleven year old and have no idea what eighty percent of it meant. And that was like exciting. That was interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now we sort of talk about it as like, I fell down the rabbit hole. But I do think that there is like a really unique feeling of like, and some people I think take it too far. And you, you know, you read someone's newsletter or blog these days and you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I do think that if you yeah. hit the right balance, it, it, you can kind of like create these pathways for people where they're excited and they're learning stuff and they're interested and you're not talking to them like an idiot. And yeah, I think that's I, that's the important one. I, I think it, it's it's funny. Okay, so two things. One is you said earlier that that garbage day t- today is not as anarchic as it was. I don't know, it, you know, if you have something particular in mind when you say that, but to me, it has never felt anarchic. It has always felt like a pretty clear representation of your voice, and maybe one that evolves over the course of time. You know, grows well, in the audience, whatever. But it, it has never, it has never felt like spaghetti against the wall, just for what that's well, worth. Well, thank you. I, I, I only think about that actually right now because. So I, I recently moved from Substack to, to this new host, Beehive, and when I did that, yeah, uh, Beehive has these recommended article widgets that are going kind of berserk right now because the old content is being recommended. Uh, so, like where previously you would just see like you know, top posts in the last six months. It's mm-hmm. just showing people crazy stuff that I wrote like four years ago. And oh, I, wow. I actually okay, just pulled gotcha. one up, which uh, <laughs> at the bottom of my most recent post is uh, a headline that I don't really totally remember writing, which is called, I suppose anything is a flashlight if you want it to be, which is like <laughs> a thing that I wrote and emailed to people five years ago or whatever it was. So, um, you know, I, and it's not something that I think I would put in a subject line now, but um oh maybe i mean i mean i I don't think it's any less true five years later right and you know what like if you want (laughs) to if you want to spend enough time and effort yeah you could i mean dune 2 has that cup that everyone wants to have sex with i don't know if you saw that in the movie theater so uh it looks (laughs) like the worm you know like so you know yeah i guess it's still true (laughs) i don't know the um so okay so in moving the the not even I let, let, I want to talk about the move but let's but but just in terms of the evolution of 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 what garbage day isn't about like you said love to have fun online was sort of a, a both a creed of core and also a, a a a reminder to yourself is it is that has that been continuous throughout or do you find yourself now with more people reading you and certainly I think people who, who matter reading you do you feel like oh hang on I have to be less fun, more business. No, it's not so much the readership. Actually, what happened was, uh, it is kind of a funny story. Like garbage. I used to have like a very different format, which was like, nothing really took importance over anything else. It was just sort of like a list of stuff. And, um, then the insurrection happened, which, uh, okay. So this is sort of a funny story. So basically I, I split my time. Insurrection stories. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, I split my time between uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and New York. Where so my girlfriend is from Sao Paulo, and we go back okay, and forth okay. quite a bit. So uh, the, their New Year's it, like goes from like Christmas into Carnival. That's kind of where sure. I'm, I'm there right now. I'm here right now, and it's oh, wow, that's cool. what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Um. So it's like the January is like a big month for Brazilians. <laughs> Uh, so that day, like I kind of knew, obviously, like most reporters that like stuff was kicking off in, in DC, but I, I went away from the internet and I, I had some, like, <laughs> I had some extremely suspicious Brazilian sushi that I shouldn't have had. Typically Brazilian sushi is pretty good, but I was okay. very ill. I was very okay. ill. And I was, I was in the bathroom, like most of the afternoon and okay. Donald Trump is like going berserk on what was then Twitter, just like tweeting, like incitements to violence and i'm like watching yeah. people get hurt and i'm it was kind of like a, a moment for me where i was like you know like i'm gonna just like i'm gonna express my full opinion about how angry i am right now because like i don't feel well i'm like far away from home and i feel like you know like yeah. an astronaut watching the nukes go off from space like from a different country um and so like i started like just basically being like take him off the internet like take this like tweeting like take this guy off the internet and then the next day i think it was I I wrote the first top essay that would go in Garbage Day. And now there's one every issue. But I had never done that before because up until that point, 
I don't know, like going back to the idea of like breaking the rules that you're told uh, during like peak Facebook time, like I was always told like the mid-length essay, nobody wants to read it. Right. And nobody wants opinion and no one wants snark and like all of this like um, post Gawker correctiveness that like I always hated anyways and didn't think was right. I finally just like broke it and I was like, okay, I'm going to do it yeah, uh, because this is a moment in time. Um, And then I never stopped because people turns out did want that. And maybe it was the timing. Maybe it was the way I did it. I don't know. But yeah, I I, I think I mean, it's funny, like an axiom of my vice days and I don't know if this is one that you ever heard bounce around, but it was just like things should be as long as they are good. And I heard that. Yeah. I, you know I what I mean? It's like so yeah. that can be five seconds or that can be five minutes or that can be five hours, whatever the case may be is. It just has to be good. Right. And then people will respond to it that way. Like the, the, the idea that you can formulate or format yourself to perfection is just not right. It's, it's, no. it's not an element of it, but it's, it's, it's not the, the full thing. And I do think like we're in a bit of a, like we've gone through a bit of a shift where people now more so than seven years ago, let's say pre COVID or something like people now do want stranger forms, different forms of digital media than they used to. Like we've, we've progressed quite a a far ways from like, look at this dog that went viral on YouTube for catching a Frisbee. Like, like the, the, the today show, like what's a segment, like what's happened on the internet stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's all over. And so I do think like, there are a lot of people, not just me, but like a lot of people coming out of the woodwork being like, wait, like my weird thing can exist. Yeah. And like, that's okay. Which is cool. Yeah. Like it's, it's, I think it's very inspiring actually. Well, I, 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 a hundred percent. I mean, and I had a, I had a, I think this is the thing. I think like, I look at, I, I mean, I, I, as you know, from, from just looking at the list on sick, I look at tons of different newsletters and read a bunch and follow a bunch. And, and I think what I like about garbage day is that as a, as a former, like, let's call it sales guy, business development professional, I can see the subject matter that you cover as being adjacent to a bunch of industries and a bunch of, you know, sort of thought leadership that's valuable. But as a, as a reader, I'm, I get sucked in and, 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 you know, typically like impressed by the fact that you manage to go so deep into these conversations and these, you know, proverbial rabbit holes without, exerting a level of like, I don't know what condescension to the audience about how they don't know about it or, you know, the, the, the sort of obvious importance of this thing. And then, and, and then you like your ability to essentially say this thing that happened in 4chan in 2014 or on Reddit, whenever that X number of people saw who no one else would ever be aware of, but is are is is now like the sonic boom culturally. I, I think it's it's you know unequal basically, and so yeah, I you impressed thank the you. Shit out of me. There you go. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah, just, I, I, <laughs> I I I came of age uh, in a world where like every digital media whatever company had like a dude in a clap your hands and say, yeah, t-shirt being like, actually nyan cat was created in 2000. Like I never want to be that guy. Like I never want to be the like, um, actually according to like, like everyone hates that. Um, and, and I also like, I don't know. I, I've met enough people on the internet now that like most people, most people kind of get it. I actually think yeah. like, I, I, I think most people are now so online that they don't know that they know it, like especially post COVID, like everyone has their own weird internet hyperfixation now. Sure. And so I, I think the real trick for anyone writing about this stuff is is actually just like getting people to open up to the possibility that like they are as online as I am. Uh, it, it's it's not so much a hard sell as it used to be. That's yeah, that's actually really interesting because it's. The, the, I mean, even myself, I, I'm I am sure I am as online as you are, and but I don't feel like I could possibly be based on you the, could be, you know, the level you of depth that you get into. Yeah. And it's, and so introducing that concept is, is interesting for sure. Everyone's got it deep inside. If they want to be, if they want to waste their time on the internet as much as I do, they can definitely do it. Yeah, no, but it, it is nice. And like, it is also nice now 
four years into this, I guess, almost four, going into the fourth year of this, that I don't feel nearly as like alone in it as I used to, because you've got these writer co-ops like 404 Media or, you know, the Defector Juggernaut or sure. Rusty Foster uh, and Tabs or like, uh, I think, did you do a video with Dirt recently? Did I, did yeah, I hallucinate with, that? Yeah, just last week with, um, with, uh, with Daisy, yeah. Yeah, they're great too. Like, like there's just a whole bunch of people sort of forging these like interesting paths right now. Do you? And, do you? Yeah. Sorry, just to interrupt you, but as a as a sort of as a, it, you know, as somebody who is both participant and sort of analyst of that space, do you do you look at what the sort of let's call it pure newsletter people, bootstraps? founder backed, you know, like 404, or I, I presume that's the way Rusty operates. I don't know him, but I presume, um, versus the pucks of the world or even dirts that are taking funding from outside and, and have sort of non bootstrap models. If anyone wants to give me funding, I will take it. Um, no, I, I, I don't find any difference actually. Okay. I, I think, I, and I actually don't even find any difference between distribution models where, you know, 404, I think they're hosted on Ghost, Defector is hosted on something else. Uh, some are newsletters, some are websites, some are blogs. Like, right. I don't even see much difference between what I do and like a YouTuber, actually, because I, at the end of the day, it's it all kind of just ends up the same place, which is on someone's phone screen or something. Right. And the parasocial relationship is almost the same, whether no matter what you're doing or what you're talking about. Like, um, I'm as big a fan of uh, Aftermath, the new writer uh, owned uh, gaming website, as I am like a weird man who reviews synthesizers on YouTube that I watch. Right. Like, to me, it's <laughs> yeah. like the same idea, I think. Well, OK. and and. To, and then to that end, as you see garbage day going forward, it, it it then is just will be a continued continue to be kind of an organic expression as opposed to something where you go, all right, it, by twenty twenty five, I'm going to turn twenty five years old, and I'm going to. That's right, twenty five. <laughs> I'm going to turn exactly twenty five, and so I'm going to have to have like. Uh, you know, I don't know what a company or staff or funding or an office or a golden hat or whatever. I just, I've got two more years of my parents' health insurance and then I got to <laughs> do this for real. Uh, I, um, I have a goal for this year, which I, I don't think I'm going to hit actually already. I think that um, because I have learned sort of like that when you move email hosts, um, the, the upheaval to your subscriber numbers is actually quite drastic. Um, Interesting. But that, my goal that... That, yeah. That's what I, I I haven't that and I try not to spend too much time on this newsletter are the two reasons that I haven't migrated from Substack yet. I'm sort of that that's a concern and then I'm lazy, but interesting. To, I, I was I was interested to read what you were experiencing today. Yeah, well, my my goal was a hundred thousand readers by the end of the year, and that is just an arbitrary number that the internet seems to like a hundred thousand as a number. Sure. And I feel like there's sort of a legitimacy that you gain by being a hundred thousand something on something. Yeah. Um. So that was my goal. Uh. I'm I'm. I haven't like significantly lost readers, but what is happening is that when you change hosts, you sort of awaken the ancient gmail gods that like run your your newsletter list and the churn is quite drastic so you're gaining and losing a lot of people so I'm, I'm essentially like not growing anymore and i've talked to other newsletter writers who have done migrations like this and ultimately it's good because what you're doing is you're jet you're jettisoning like you know, let's say 3000 people who never open your email. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the psychological weight of that is quite different than the reality of it. Um, so yeah, no, but in terms of like broader, just like what is garbage day? What should it be? Like I, my, um, my aspirations are actually quite small, which is that like, I just want to go to work and like, look at the internet and like, turn it into turn, like make content. And like, I don't really, I had these grand aspirations in my twenties and Hilariously, a lot of them involved like making a TV show, but like, where right. does that go now on the internet? Like, right. or, uh, you know, so, so now I think it's just about like making a sustainable living and having a good time doing it, which, you know, isn't always the case, but I, I think those are pretty grand a a aspirations sure. in their own way. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I don't, I don't disagree at all. It's just, it, it's funny. Cause it's like one of the, uh, you know, 
business theories or whatever that I, that I talk about a lot and work with a lot is the idea of like finding a super format that is a, as Brian Morrissey might call an, an atomic unit of let's call it content or brand value or IP or whatever it is. And then you go, okay, from this, how do I dimensionalize, slice, dice, distribute, expand upon this thing in as many different formats as it could be? So a piece of IP can be long form part of a series, a chapter, so on and so forth, or it can be the icon that you put on a t-shirt or a ticket to an event or whatever the, the case is. You are a gifted entertainer, I would say, uh, or at the very least, you're good at PowerPoints and keeping a, a <laughs> corporate audience engaged in the, in the, in the times that I've seen you, uh, you know, it, it walk people through your decks. What I, apropos of the TV show, I imagine at some point it would be logical to just, I don't know what, like create a little format every day or to, 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 to publish in that fashion, but I don't see you do it. And it may be because I'm just not paying attention or it could be that. No, yeah, you're right. I mean, so like a lot of these sort of redesigning this stuff coming from, you know, huge media burnout and sort of looking at these objects and being like, okay, like, do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? Like, so, you know, a lot of it's still experimentation. So I, you know, I make YouTube content because I like YouTube. I'm not good at it. It's not making money, but like, it's an interesting process. Sure. Uh, the live events weirdly have been growing like better than anything Cool. to the point where like I've done them at music festivals now, which is like my, one of my idols is uh, Adam Curtis, the British documentarian behind films like hyper normalization, bitter late. Sure. He, he did this series years ago that like, to me is like the, it's, I think it's really good to have like a, a an inspiration that you can never reach. So it's like the oh, carrot okay. stays on the stick and right, like so his me. thing. Yeah. He took his documentary hyper normalization and he changed it to be a piece of live, um, like video live oh, cool. music. Okay. He took it on tour with the, 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 with burial. And so like, this idea of like taking this thing that has no business being at a music festival and doing it there to me is like very interesting, especially because like, I think the internet has lost a bit of that kind of like, I don't want to say punk rock because that's so lame, but like, you know what I mean? Like that sort of like, this yeah. doesn't have to be something if it doesn't fit it. And right. so I really have enjoyed like going to like a rock club and like getting up on a stage and like be booping on a machine and making stuff happen on a screen and like talking about right. the internet and like, I think that stuff is is obviously where my my heart is, but like this year in particular is trying to like find a middle ground between the stuff that is like intellectually interesting and the stuff you need to do to have a business that survives. Yeah, yeah. So that sure. that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I mean, look, similar similar things with you know consulting work and advising for me, and and the idea of the newsletter as being both a business development tool a front door so to speak to to my brain but also literally like a, a almost like an obsessive compulsive exercise to get all of the stuff i read every morning out of here and so that it's you know distributed for somebody else's benefit um to that end i wanted to 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 quickly throw to the theoretical purpose of this conversation which is to chat about some of the stuff that's in the in the the the, the um newsletter this week you sent me five or so stories back, um, one of which was the ubiquitous and controversial in a loving way, Williamsburg, what happened article. Yeah. What was it about that one that, that, that grabbed you? I mean, Williamsburg is such a fast, so like, it's such a fascinating like slice of American history. And I don't think for the reasons that like, it's talked about a lot. Like, yes, obviously gentrification happened there. I first started working in Williamsburg in 2011. Mm -hmm. And even at that point, everyone was like, it's over, <laughs> which I yeah, thought was It really... had been over for a decade at that point. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> over. Okay, well, uh, now it's real over, let me tell right. you. Um, so, but I also think that I, the more I think about Williamsburg <laughs> as a cultural object, the more I, I, I tend to, 
I tend to see it as the last physical scene. And I, and I, and, mm. and, and, and you can almost time it to like the death of certain clubs, like death by audio Glasslands, sure. like, you know, and then if you look at sort of the, the, the dime square downtown scene resurgence idea, come back, it doesn't really have the same punch to it. There is no downtown scene music scene. Like people claim there is, but it's not like, it's not like it was. Yeah. And so I do think that Williamsburg, you know, as we get further away from its 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 uh, its peak, should be thought of as like the last time you had to live somewhere to be participatory in some kind of creative scene. Interesting. Interesting. I definitely felt that way when I was a teenager. Like I gotta get to Brooklyn. Like oh yeah 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 for <laughs> sure. I mean, well it was and it was it, for me it was a little bit. I've I've lived in Greenpoint for all intents and purposes for twenty five years, and the. It, 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 the 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 funny thing about it is it was like i got to go to brooklyn slash i don't want to go to brooklyn at all i if i could live anywhere else i would and the fact that it is metastasized into this place where we're going to have a you know a rooftop hermes cafe um at some point in the pretty foreseeable future is like all right it's a shift by the same token the thing that i thought was interesting about that story and and exactly to your point about the um i i don't know what like i as you were talking i was thinking about trend cycles but in that in that story there was a picture of the left bank cafe r.i.p from 1992 wow which was seven years before i got or six years before i got to new york but but four years at least before anybody ever started in my universe started talking about williamsburg and so it's just what, what it makes me think of is like that's a New York Magazine cover, and it takes twenty years for the scene to really get to a place where it's fundamentally different than that, right? Circa two thousand twelve. Is that because time, you know, runs at a certain level, or is it because the media now is so hyper syndicated that the story goes like the, the Williamsburg trend story of twenty twenty four is instantly in Bangalore, whereas at that point it never made it past the tri-state, you know? Oh, I see what you're saying. Like the, are we like consuming trends faster than they're happening, which makes them feel like, 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 are we currently seeing something happen, but because we're so used to like the hyper speed of it, we don't actually see the slow growth of it. Is, is that kind of what you're yeah, arguing? Well, we, we, it's, it's, I mean, it's hard to judge. I, I'm going to bring up Carlo Rovelli for the second issue episode of this talk in a row, which is weird. Are you familiar? Are you a fan? I am not familiar. He, he's a oh god. Here I am explaining <laughs> physics to people again on this thing. He's an Italian physicist, and he writes books about very theoretical physics. That, but he does so in layman's language, like easy okay. to read, understandable layman's language. But one of his big things is like where you are on space time is totally relative to where you are on space time and how close you are to, you know, big gravity or whatever the case is. And so it, it's not so much that, that things, the time is happening faster than trends. It's just more that the trends have always fast happened at the same speed, but because of hyper syndication and awareness, they seem to be happening faster than they were. I see what you mean. Yeah, that is interesting. And it is possible uh, and what's, what's really frustrating is like, I'm not 19, <laughs> so I can't like, I can't, you know, I think, you know, I'm 25 and I, uh, I have this problem now where, you know, every time I write about any sort of trend, I have to like search myself and be like, okay, would I dunk on myself nine years ago if I wrote this down? And if so, would I be correct or would I be young and stupid and wrong? Right, and like, right, right. and so I can't like access the emotional muscle to be like, okay, is this cool or not? Like, is, is, you know, is this real? Because I, I also remember as, as a young person, like being told things were trends and being yeah. like, you're, you're out of your mind. Like, uh, like rainbow parties or whatever, uh, or like there was a whole wave of, um, like the Mike.com era mm -hmm. where like all these people were just like writing about like random stuff on the internet that like wasn't real. And then everyone would be like, that's not like, 
not real. Like what you're talking about, it just didn't happen and, uh, or isn't a trend. And so, yeah, I, I do think, I, I think my instinct is that it's just harder to tell now because there's less media mm-hmm. written by professionals. So like, it's just, it's, okay, that's it's an like important but, caveat. Yeah, yeah, I get you. And, and and only professionals in the sense where it's it's noisier and there's just less there, I think there's less thought about like is this does this matter is this real yeah and, and to the point where it's almost make me wonder if that's just like a generational shift that like this idea of culture being real and mattering just like maybe doesn't doesn't need to exist anymore because of I don't know TikTok but like no you I'm like, I'm wrapped up in my own semantic thought, like thought thought process here, because like, I do wonder, like, is there another Williamsburg happening somewhere? And it's just happening on a timeline that like doesn't fit into TikTok. Well, that, that, or, or it, it happens in a, in a, in a cultural milieu that we don't understand to see. And so don't see. And I I mean, I, I, as a, for instance, like I was reading, um, maybe it was deal book this morning about the man, I don't remember what it was. Anyway, I was reading something this morning about the Indian national identity system and how the Indian stack, which is the identity and authentication system for individuals like our social security, which is then tied to your, um, utility bills it's tied to your mortgage it's tied to your okay. bank account it's tied, it's just like all of this stuff so so what they've been able to do is is cut out all of these middlemen in the economic situations who were siphoning off right marginal value which is returning a bunch of wealth to people is enabling people to do things that they haven't been able to do going forward the reason i bring it up is because i i first i went to 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 bombay um, Mumbai, depending on, on how local you are, the, the, uh, in 2009 and was shocked about lots of different things. The, the, the high low there between extreme poverty and extreme wealth is much more pronounced than, than we see sure. in the States, right? It, it, like at scale, it's different, but, or at scale, maybe it's the same, but in, 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 presentation it's very different there the 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 caste system was hard for me to get my head around like this idea that these people are there there are people who just believe that they are predestined to suffer through this life and then will you know be reincarnated later it's it's just like from a western perspective it's really hard to like wrap your head around but the 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 main thing and this is the reason i have, have been soliloquizing is that it struck me that there was no youth culture to speak of at all in the way that we think of teenagers and all of this stuff. Cut forward 12 years, 10, 12, 13 years, however many it is. The proliferation of the Indian technology stack, increase in wealth, brands arriving, so on and so forth. You, you just feel like there must be that youth culture scene there. But we, so it's invisible. To I, us. Can I can tell you. I can because I, oh, I, I yeah, covered it. Yeah. So uh, – God, this would have been 2015 probably. And it was really funny when I wrote my story eventually, I I compare I compared the the hipster neighborhood that I was in in the piece to Williamsburg and my editor cut it out and she's like as a rule like do never never do that. That's extremely late. <laughs> never do compare not anything do that. to Williamsburg. Never compare anything to New York neighborhoods. And I oh, like okay, and I thought right. yeah, and I, I thought, thought that was like a cuz sorry, Williamsburg sui generis like that's this this is yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but, go ahead. So, so they were in Bandra is where I was. And sure. I, okay. I followed a ne- no, uh, neighborhood in Mumbai, in Mumbai. So it's like, it's like, side. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's or, like on the other side sorry, of the bridge. Me. Um, and it's cool. It's like a cool area. It's like very bohemian. And the piece that I was working on was like this two sided thing where I went, do, do you remember uh Superwoman? I think Lily Singh. She has like a she has like a late night show, or did, or yes. she was like a yeah, YouTuber. Yeah, yeah. She was a YouTuber to begin with, and then yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I went to go see her live, which was wild oh, because it was just like tons of Indian teenagers going to a YouTube concert, which was right. like wild. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and then I went on a video shoot with these guys who were kind of like. They were kind of like a jackass from India. They're called All India Bakchod, which is like a, a play on All India Radio, but Bakchod okay. means like dumb motherfucker. And like <laughs> I went to like a, a video shoot with them up in like the Bandura Hills. And it was all about kind of like 
Indian YouTube exploding, which at the time in 2015, like it had, it had arrived big yeah. time. And then when I went back a year later for a different story, a bunch of those creators were in hiding. They had been chased like Interesting. Uh, off the internet by Hindu nationalists. Uh, they like one of them was like threatened with inking, which is where like people cover you in like permanent ink and they, you can't get it off. Like, like it was a real it was a real hard Yikes. right cultural shift but yeah. but to to your point like i do i do think like i do think there are cool neighborhoods everywhere for young people <laughs> <laughs> i think every young person gets a cool neighborhood but i do think that um like the the physicality of 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 that kind of idea yeah. has shifted to a degree um but like you said, I don't know if I'm just like in the thick of it and we're going to look back at this period of time and be like, oh, yeah, that was the – actually, I look back at the late 2010s and I'd be like, oh, yeah, everyone moved to L.A. And right. now I'm like, oh, everyone's back in New York. That's yeah, how I yeah. feel now. Sure. Um, so I do think like there's a bit of it you can only tell years later down the line. Yeah. I, I, no, I, I, yeah. I, I definitely had – I had the – the exp and, and I, I want to move on to something else in a sec, but just – as I was reading through it, I was reminded of a bunch of places that I had totally forgotten about, which were touchstones in the neighborhood at that time. And then I was also struck by how many of the places I think of as touchstones that weren't mentioned, so much so that I read through almost 600 comments last night just to be like, hang on, they didn't mention KCDC? I'm, I'm oh, going to yeah, fix they, that. They but, didn't mention KCDC. I forgot. Yeah. Wow. No, well, not only did they not mention it, but it, I, I mean, I didn't read all of the comments, but I skimmed through almost 600 comments and nobody in the comments mentioned KCDC wow. either, which I was then took upon myself I'm from to correct. The, just, just for your, your listeners' uh, context, I'm from the matchless Enids era. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's where I, that's when I got to the city. Uh, the, the, um, yeah, the, the, although the, the commenters would have pointed out that once you're east of McCarran Park, that's oh Greenpoint. Boy. Here so, we go. Yeah. Get yeah. out of well, here. Well, I would say Greenpoint starts after NASA app. That's where I personally believe it starts. But... <laughs> okay. <fine>. Um, <laughs> Fair <yeah>. enough. <laughs> I was at the Turkey's Nest long before it became you know, I don't, I the don't, Daredevil I, Bar. I didn't, you know, it's funny. I didn't read closely, but I didn't see the Turkey's Nest mentioned either. That's criminal to me. That's Which, crazy. Again, that I, that one I did not double check, so I can't get it. But but it was exactly like that. It was just like how could you how could you not mention the turkey's nest? Okay, and maybe Listeners, they did. But like, if any of you are in Williamsburg or or, or South Greenpoint, uh, <laughs> uh, go to the turkey's nest and order an absinthe margarita to go. They will put it in a styrofoam container, and you can drink it in the park and go insane. Trust me, it's a great night. Absinthe margarita. Yeah, I did it once and it was Dude. it was horrible. Yeah, I can imagine. Speaking speaking of that, God, we're gonna get off this Williamsburg article, but 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 speaking of that, also Cokies, which was venerated in the article pretty prominently, I only went once and it was horrible. But you know, these are I never these, I, these are they're rights of rights of Cokies was the bar I, called Cokies that sold cocaine. I had heard about it. I, you know, <laughs> I worked at Vice. I had heard about it, um, but uh, I, I never, I never went. No, fair enough. All right. Well, let, let's let's move on then for a second because the, the one of the the places that I, I I have a feeling you've got a great sort of point of view is is um, around AI and so moving from the the physical and the, of, of location to the virtual of let's call it relationship. You you highlighted the article about. Um, AI chatbot girlfriends essentially like being headed for a, a fall or is that a f correct way to characterize it or just not? Yeah. Looking? Yeah. So yeah, it's funny. Like every time there's like a new internet hype cycle, everyone just sort of pretends like everything that's happening is happening for the first time. Right. And it's really easy to get sucked into it. And I felt that way about AI girlfriends where at first I was like, Oh wow. Like that's crazy. Like people are like talking to, I think replica was the big one you could have yeah, sex was, with for yeah. a while. And then I was like, wait, one of like the first things I ever saw on the internet was that cult in Russia where they worship Gadget, the uh, the mouse from Rescue Rangers. Do you remember that like blog post from like two thousand nine? No. 
Uh, so yeah, you can, you, you can Google it like the cults okay. of gadget and like, there have been guys like, uh, I feel like every six months there's like some story where it's like man in Japan, Mary's hologram of Hatsune Miku. Like, like it just like, this has been going on forever. Right. And I, 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 I have to imagine that the only reason like we're talking about it now is one that perhaps AI makes it a little stickier. You yeah. know, it makes, <laughs> that's a bad, uh, it makes it a little yeah, uh, it. more difficult to, to remove yourself out of that situation. Also um, not great, but okay. <laughs> yeah, it's still pretty bad. Uh, yeah. But I also think that most of the AI panic is actually just AI hype disguised. And yeah. and you can tell this because most of the AI panic is about like men dating chatbots and like AI taking your job. And what they're no one's really talking about is like AI non sensual non consensual sexual material up until Taylor Swift this week. So right. like the stuff that people like are panicking about with AI is just AI boosterism, I think. And the AI girlfriends thing is part of this. Like yeah. there's been weird guys dating cartoon characters for like thirty years. Like it's a thing. <laughs> Like, let them do what they want to do, you know? No, I mean, 100%. I was, I was reading, there's that, the piece in The New Yorker this week about um, all of the books about, let's call it, the, the digital, the late capitalism, digital surveillance state, yada, yada, yada. Um, but one of the, it, it opens with a story about John Perry Barlow at Davos in 1996, and it talks about his um his original manifesto in in response to the telecommunications act of 96 which included a folder of a guy having sex with a german shepherd so yeah fair enough weird weird that, sex stuff it's been around forever yeah, yeah i have a i have a friend he's got a phd in in essentially meme theory memes um and like one of his like theses was about the evolution of vr so he's kind of on like a victory lap right now and he <laughs> He always talks about how the minute we created VR, we created teledildonics, which is the act of like having sex with each other over the internet. And like these things have always gone hand in hand. If you Interesting. Will. And okay. So, so I want to get theoretical for just five seconds here. The, the PhD in meme theory. So does that mean from a, from a sort of a, I don't know what semiotic standpoint is he, do, when we, do we create VR when we think of it? as a concept or do we create VR circa lawnmower man when you're actually putting matrixes? That, that is an interesting question. I have to ask him, by the way, you should check out his work. Jamie, uh, Jamie Cohen. Awesome. Um, he's, he's a professor. I, I do events with him actually sometimes. And uh, his, his, his sort of like take on the VR thing is that it was a, you know, you can find historical proof of this, that it was largely based on the, 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 Timothy Leary crew dropping acid and imagining virtual worlds and then trying to bring them to life. Oh, interesting. And then my friend Jamie's kind of punchline to this is like the first thing we did with VR other than have sex with it was create an office that you could sit in. <laughs> um, so it's like a real, it's a real failure to achieve the utopianism of the, of the sixties. Okay, so speaking of failures to achieve utopianism, then my current take on AI is that it, is a machine to just make more and there's almost nothing useful about it except for that. It is very good at making more. That's not to say that it won't be useful in the future or that there aren't like super valuable or super sinister means for it to express itself. But like, I don't know, just seems like just more now to me. Yeah, when it first, when like generative AI specifically first arrived with like Dolly Mini and Dolly 2, I was like, wow, this is really cool. Like you can just like make stuff. And, you know, it, it's a neat party trick. Um, and some of the tools are better than others. I think Runway is very impressive. It's a, it's a video AI. I've used Eleven Labs several times to make audio clones of various famous people to make them say libelous things. Uh, it's a fun <laughs> game. Um, but now that we're moving into like year three, I think of, of mainstream AI, um, emergence, yeah. I don't find any use for this stuff. And the people who do find use for it, like they kind of sound more and more like a cult and not in the crypto way, weirdly, like the crypto people by year three were like, yeah, this stuff is broken. And like, maybe one day it'll work. Uh, the AI people are like way more delusional. I, I find interesting. Interesting. But I agree so, with you. Like I even, I mean, 
I I've u- I used ChatGPT. The, the coolest thing I did with ChatGPT was I ordered groceries with it. I ordered, I asked it to plan out seven days worth of meals. And then I used a plugin with Instacart to just order all my groceries. And they sure. arrived in like two hours. It felt like the future. It ordered me a bunch of weird stuff. I had a good time. I never did it again. Right. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so, and I feel like that's my whole story with AI is like, it was kind of, it's kind of neat, but I can't figure out what to do with it. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it, it, you, you imagine it, it, I mean, the, the the real destiny of it, to, to my mind, is is that it ends up being like electricity or like the internet or whatever. It's there. It works. It's adding some level of ease or or utility or convenience. But it's it's like to marvel at the fact that your light comes on every time you touch it is ridiculous. Yeah, I I I assume we'll find some use for it. I don't think this will. This is like the next Bitcoin or Ethereum to that extent. Yeah, sure. But I, I think that it won't be very sexy. I think it'll just be like very boring and like yeah. there's just generative AI stuff stuffed in in different devices or platforms. So okay, so I, so I want to ask him then. You you I would describe you as generally speaking a funny dude, and um, and I don't mean that in a in a like try hard funny way. I mean like you know you're you're thank you. You're funny. One thing that I have noticed AI is good for is accidentally creating comedy. And you've done a little bit of experimenting with that, right? Like as a, as a, do you think there's, I guess what I'm asking is like, if hallucinations are a feature, not a bug, and many of those hallucinations are funny, could it be productive in that way? Like being accidentally sublime yeah i mean uh, to go even further like i i am i am not super hung up on like the ethics of ai i I actually think that like they're pretty easy to work out and like there will be models that have data in it that they're allowed to use and then there's ones that you can make on your own that are illegal and it'll kind of almost mirror the way music has evolved for the last 20 years and so like you can make like a bootleg remix. You can you can you can do that now with anything. And I and I, I've used so I used AI most recently to <laughs> I built an AI clone of Elon Musk's voice and I use it like a ventriloquist dummy in live events where it talks to me and I talk back to it. Okay, and got I animated it. it. Um okay. and like it's a funny bit, like people enjoy it. Um but like the AI didn't I don't know. I don't I actually don't think AIs can be funny if you ask them to be yeah yeah you can definitely yeah but you can definitely like make something weird with them and then people enjoy it i i i I, and i think that's that wave is about to hit because we did this with photoshop years ago too where like i would be in art classes in high school and be told like you can't use photoshop and now i'm pretty sure you can't get an art degree in america without learning how to use photoshop yeah and so i do think like ai there's a part of that will evolve similarly not totally one-to-one but similar no no of course interesting um, it's pretty it's pretty cool for video actually i you can throw like i, I took my logo and i made like an a, um like a, a sting for my youtube channel just by throwing my logo into runway and making a bunch of different aesthetics so okay, there's like, cool. like interesting and then it like glitches as like different and like it's a cool effect that like would have taken me hours and hours and hours to do and it was i did it in 10 minutes like, okay it, so you know. what you're saying is you created a modular branding system for your if so, if Central someone would like start. to, uh, yeah, if someone yeah. would like to invest in my <laughs> my new advertising firm, uh, we have a system uh, where I can uh, tap into uh, popular trends and aesthetics for you, um, uh, dude. And- well, okay, so that, so then that that begs the other question, which is like y- you and and I, I think it gets to the to the prevailing all of the the bad news prevailing about digital media companies and about news organizations in particular this week, like. W- what I said to Daisy last week, and and which I believe very very fervently and and stand by, is that all of these journalists have incredible skills that can be put to use in lots of different ways. So if they if those journalists, and I certainly don't count myself among them, if those journalists are willing to say we do some things because they are not journalistic in, in, uh, uh, endeavors, but we use our journalist skills to do it. And then there are other things that are journalistic and are, you know, conscribed to the, to, to the realities. It, but it's, it, I have always struggled with people who, who 
aren't willing to see that as a continuum. Where do you find yourself? Because I could imagine you being like a really valuable agency advisor, board member, you know, consultant, but you also are like a true investigative journalist as far as I'm concerned. And, and so I wonder about where you see yourself there. I've, I've done consulting work. Like I'll go to conferences and put on a little suit and I'll talk about like professional stuff without swearing. A suit? Yeah. A little suit, a little tiny suit. And I won't well, swear. And, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> And I've done it. I've consulted for brands and talked to them about this stuff. And I don't mind. I actually enjoy doing it. Yeah. Um, in terms of like journalists trying to find themselves after the apocalypse kind of thing, I, I, I take a very simplistic view to it, which is that, you know, because I've, I've lived outside of America for many years on and off in my adult life. And, and I, I take it very seriously when I say like the First Amendment more than any sort of first free speech nonsense you talk about. The First Amendment means that any American can become a journalist if they want to. And we've sure. seen this, like, you know, citizen journalism has won Pulitzer's at this point. Sure. So journalism is, a, I had an editor once tell me that like journalism isn't about adjectives, it's about verbs. And at the time I was like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but now I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah. It's a thing you do. And I think that like most journalists, nine out of 10 of them would like to just like sit down at a computer or a desk and look at, look up some cool stories and, and then figure out a, a way to tell them. Yeah, sure. And the problem is that at least for the last 50, for most of my adult life in journalism and in the periphery of it, like most journalists are totally removed from their audiences. And the internet has made this really difficult because it used to be like, you know, I, I grew up in Boston. My parents read the Boston Globe. Like they were reporting for their community. Yeah. And like that's kind of how it used to work. And, you know, on the national level, then you're, the nation is your community. Right, but sure. for most people my age, 25, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they have never really had them. They, they, they've only existed in the world of never read the comments, which was like one of the first things I was ever told as a journalist it was like, they're going to roast you in the comments. Don't read them, which is an insane thing to say to somebody, because like if the people reading you are like attacking you in the comment section, why are you writing for them? Like, that's crazy right. to me. And yeah, so yeah. I do wonder if like we come through this, this moment with a whole bunch of different kinds of journalistic shops doing a whole bunch of different kinds of journalism, whether it's a podcast or video or a newsletter, whatever it is. And the big lesson of this era is like finding audiences again and like writing, making things for them, which I, I think would make journalism. Sure. I think journalism is better when you know what community you're making it for. Sure. Do I, you, do you feel like that's then achievable like it, 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 knowing that there that there are all of these people who are you know now looking for something new to do how many of them can follow your model do you think before it falls apart for everybody or does it not i mean or do we just see the redistribution of scale accordingly i can barely follow the model i'm on right now so no i don't recommend it for others um, and the subscription thing, okay. I've heard a couple of different versions of this. Like, you know, there's people have been talking about the subscription apocalypse that could be happening at any moment. It's possible. But the people I, I, the other people on subscription income that I talk to all kind of report different experiences And the way that I've sort of been beginning to process this is that this subscription is not uniform. Like if you are a scoops based newsletter, if you're making like investigative scoops constantly, you're going to see a ton of churn because people are going to pay for a subscription to read your scoop yeah, and then yeah. they're probably going to leave. My churn is actually quite low. I'm very lucky. My spikes are probably nearly as high as somebody who's, you know, doing constant scoop based journalism, but it depends on what it is. And I think it's the same way with um, like streaming platforms where you're probably going to keep your Netflix subscription, but you might like subscribe to Amazon to watch like a new show and then bounce off of it because you don't need it anymore. Yeah. 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 At the same time, like subscriptions are not an end all be all. They, I don't only rely on them. I do ads as well and I do other things. But yeah. I, I, think I think paying for things online for now will work and will probably only get better as it gets easier because like, it's still kind of difficult. But I don't think it's the end all be all because I just don't think there is an end all be all because sure. the Internet's constantly changing. And I don't know, you you probably remember this like 15 years ago, you know, places like CRJ and Neiman Lab are being like, this is it. Like this will fix everything like an iPad app. <laughs> the, the, everything will be tablet based and we'll have yeah. to put newspapers on tablets. And like it just never works like that. It's always a mishmash.
Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's true. It's funny you should say that because it's it's when you said the person who told me that we should be doing everything on iPad is a guy named Chris Batty, who I don't know if you've ever heard Chris's name, but he was the founding publisher at Gawker. Funny enough. Interesting. Very and interesting. And he after he was he was at Gawker for, I don't know, ten or ten ten plus years, but left well before the end the end. He he then went on and, and started did it did a startup that was a, essentially like a tablet based conversion system for brands to 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 publish on tablet. And the idea was this is the reason I bring it up. The idea was that the readers on tablet are executive decision makers, high earners, very attractive demographic. And so, from an advertising perspective, you want to go for those audiences because brands will pay. Yeah, big dollars for them. To me, and this is part of our conversation around uh, the, the 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 ad side of monetizing newsletters. To me, if you could winnow down to the people who read Garbage Day closely, who are decision makers in business, you could then create a, a super powerful subscription offer for them, and 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 then also create a super powerful hook for advertisers. The the difficulty is understanding from the data that we're given how people how people make that. I have a a friend who has an he has an AI essentially calendar detective that looks at all of your appointments and tells you by searching with AI, the, the information around them, who they are, right? So they could tell me all about your oh, your history and that's stuff. That's cool. I was wondering, I was just, I was thinking the other day, I was like, I've got 5,000 or so subscribers. I wonder if I could put their email account addresses into that thing and have them tell, have it tell me essentially who everybody is. So then I can then segment them accordingly. You ever tried to do yeah. like that? I don't mean with AI. I just mean generally to understand who your audience is. No, other than using my reader's emails to commit financial crimes. Like I really don't <laughs> do much with them. Um, you know, that's, that's this my is not bad. financial crime advice, guys. I just yeah, want to be I don't, clear about that. I don't have that hustle mentality, you know? Um, no, I, I've wondered. I, the, the closest I've come to mining my reader's data is actually just in planning live events, which has actually been pretty useful. Yeah. Um, and it's... Uh, because both Substack and Beehive are are pretty good about it. Although I will say, after switching to Beehive, like the data is just so much better. Yeah, Daisy um, said this. Daisy said the same thing. I feel like I can really understand who's reading Garbage Day for the oh, first cool. time, and it's like kind of breaking my brain a little bit because you kind. Of, I have a well, I have a Discord, so I I talk to the most enthusiastic a thousand people, but and I love them. Um, of course. But they are the most enthusiastic a thousand people. So kind of seeing the behaviors of other readers and like when they're reading and how and where, like that stuff is interesting to me. I I, I like the data side of, of publishing. I, I'm not so too cool for school that I don't uh, enjoy looking at that stuff, you know? Yeah. Well, I, look, I mean, it's, it's uh, hopefully everybody is sort of circumspect enough that you go. I want to speak to people in the language they speak to each other in so that I'm understood and we can progress the conversation or exchange information, whatever it is. Um, so wanting to know that and having the data show you, it, it, it makes total sense and not in a like spreadsheet guru, you know, right. photographic memory kind of way. It's just like, I just want to know who's here so I can talk to them more effectively. Yeah, one of the first things I ever did with Garbage Day after my like first full or second full year doing it, I took all my traffic, put it in a spreadsheet with all the subject lines, and then I made an average subject line length for most traffic per newsletter issue to like see if there was any correlation. And like there absolutely was. Like there's a sweet spot between like 30 and 45 characters, I think, 30 and 60 characters. If you go over it, like people aren't going to click. And if you go under it, like people don't know what it is. Um, and like, there's certain like data things that I think are useful. Um, you know, knowing what time to publish, I publish after lunch because that's when I would read stuff because I'm full from lunch. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. like, it's just like little things like that. You know, I think if you go beyond that, you're kind of, you know, you're just chasing like internet ghosts to yeah, like, yeah. make your traffic or, look better. Or, but... Right. Or you're, you know, employing a team and the team is also paying for itself in some other way. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
Cool. Well, look, Ryan, this has been really fascinating. Thank you for taking the time to to do it. And you know, I, I think more so than anything else, I, I I'm I'm glad to have the conversation and understand the sort of your point of view a little bit better. But but also, you know, to the extent that this conversation can be an encouragement to keep doing more, better, and dimensionalize, like I, I just think it's tremendously impressive. And I would encourage everybody who has listened to to both subscribe and then also to, you know, engage Ryan in whatever uh, dialogue because he's a, a fantastic conversant. Well, th- thank you very much. Uh, seriously, that that is very overwhelming. And you know what? Uh, next time, uh, next time I'm at Union Pool, I'll uh, I'll buy you two beers for five dollars, which I think was the deal fifteen years ago. <laughs> I mean. Ryan, if we're not drinking nine dollar PBRs, what are we doing? You know, hey, it's like... back in my day, you could go to Union Pool and you could get two Budweisers for five dollars, and you could get a taco out of the taco truck in the back for another five dollars, and that's all you needed because the fire pit was going and everyone was having a nice time. Now yeah, I don't know what's going on. Everyone's yeah, making TikTok I mean, need... videos in the photo booth. Who knows? The kids these days. The yeah. kids these days. Um, but no, yeah. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. Of course, of course. All right, dude. We'll listen. Talk to you again soon, but thanks and bye, everybody. Bye.